Hello, my name is Bobby Ampazan. I'm the Communications Associate for the Council on Food, Agricultural, and Resource Economics. We are so pleased to have you join us today for a what we think is a really compelling and current discussion, Hispanic farmers in the Midwest, a growing and underreported trend. And I guess we're gonna begin with a shameless self-promotion of myself, Bobby Ampazan, the Communications Associate for CFAIR, a one-time print and broadcast journalist, check me out at www.bobbyampazon.com. Corinne Valdivia is the D. Howard Doan Professor of Agricultural and Applied Economics in the College of Agriculture, Food, and Natural Resources at the University of Missouri. She is a founding fellow of the Cambio Center that dedicates research and education to the integration of Latinos and newcomers into Midwestern communities. She studies the impact of transformational changes, such as migration, globalization, and climate change, and how individuals, families, and rural communities negotiate change in the Midwest, as well as the Andes of Bolivia and Peru and East Africa. She teaches international agricultural development and policy and directs the interdisciplinary international development graduate minor there at the university. Maria Rodriguez Alcala, works for the University of Missouri Extension in Community Economic Development in Southwest Missouri as a PhD student and in her postdoctoral fellowship. She worked with several projects involving Hispanics in the state of Missouri, first with the Center for Health Policy, the School of Medicine, and then with the Cambio Center. Before coming back to Missouri, she worked in international agriculture in South America. Finally, Stephen Janetta is an Extension Associate Professor in Applied Social Sciences and University of Missouri Extension Community Development Education Director. He directs the Cambio Center, where he facilitates research on changing communities, changing demographics. He co-chairs the annual Cambio de Colores Conference and manages the center. In his Extension role, he provides leadership to Extension programs in community development. Stephen, Maria, and Corinne, we're so delighted to have you with us today to talk about Hispanic farming demographics in the Midwest. Just a quick note on who we are, the Council on Food, Agricultural Resource Economics is a uh, nonprofit and the scope of our activities encompass a broad and growing range of subject matter that the agricultural and applied economics profession covers. Check us out, visit us at cfair.org. So without any further delay, I'm going to kick the webinar over to Stephen, who's going to kick us off. Uh, thank you, Bobby. Uh, this is uh, Steve Janetta at the University of Missouri, and um, we at the Cambia Center have been doing research on changing um, communities uh, in the Midwest for uh, nearly 15 years. Now we're just celebrating our 15th anniversary this year. Much of our work is focused on um, understanding changing communities um, in the, primarily in the Midwest as, it re as resulting from the movement of peoples. And uh, primarily um, we're, we've been studying the movement of Latinos into rural areas because that tends to be the largest group. And um, the movement of, of immigrants primarily into rural areas is something that's relatively new in terms of our um, immigration trends in the United States. Uh, when we look at the Hispanic population in the US, since the mid 1990s, we've seen um, uh, a rapid, rapid increase. And um, a lot of that uh, is about the time we started to see them moving into to rural areas of, um, of Missouri. Uh, other rural states, uh, Kansas, Nebraska, and a few others were seeing it about 10 years earlier. Uh, but across the Midwest, we really, since the, the mid 80s, we've seen quite a bit of growth in, in the Hispanic population, uh, moving primarily into areas where there's work in agro-processing, um, services like um, uh, hotel, restaurant work, and um, um, some light manufacturing. And so we've seen a growth in both the U.S. born and the his, uh, foreign born Hispanic population. Um, and, and the numbers are, are relatively large. You can see by uh, since 2016 now, the population is at 57.5 million people. Um, and we also see Latinos engaged quite a bit in, um, in entrepreneurship. 
and um, so the in 2015 there were over four four million Hispanic-owned business, uh, primarily fueled by small business growth. A lot of the entrepreneurs we're seeing in in the Latino community tend to be small, and quite a few of them are. Um, we might ca call necessity entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs that are um, doing it because they've had difficulty uh, finding work in the in the workplace, and so they'll create businesses to serve other Latinos primarily. And then also sometimes we'll see issues where they're they, they feel like they're not doing as well in the workplace or suffering some discrimination in the workplace. Then they will um, form businesses. Um, to, 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 to remove themselves from that environment and also to, to provide a service to the Latino population. Now, when we start talking about Latino farmers, um, uh, their entrepreneurship is different from that trend. They tend to be going into farmers be farming because they want to. Um, they have, a lot of times they're looking to grow up their investments with their, their family. Um, trying to create assets for family members and future generations. Um, they're also part of a, a, a transition into farming at a time when, in agriculture, when new people, there aren't that many new people going into farming. Um, and they're, uh, some are um, in a position to, to, to take on larger farming operations when, when they become available. But as a community, that's not really happening a lot because most of the farms tend to be pretty small averaging between 20 and, and 45 acres in Missouri and, and other states are not, not that far different. Um, but there's also some uh, cultural difference between the mainstream um, agriculture and, and Latino farmers. Um, the Latinos tend to be um, pay as they go. They, they really don't borrow money very often. Um, they have, uh, some have aversion to credit um, and, and that showed up in our research. Um, and they don't typically uh, seek access to resources, um, additional resources like through the FSA and other farm serving organizations. Um, and then there are also not very many that are agriculture enterprises. They're not forming cooperatives, although they could benefit from some of those kinds of things, or other agriculture enterprise um, operations that, that, that might help them grow their businesses a little bit uh, more. So when we think about the Hispanic population in a rural state, I'm showing you um, Missouri. The, one of the remarkable things about it is it's really widespread. Um, here in Missouri, uh, we have 114 counties in the city of St. Louis, and we have a, a Hispanic population in every single county. Uh, some of them are really, really small, but you can see uh, others, um, particularly where we have a, a concentrations in agro-processing or um, tourism, that you'll see a, a fairly large percentage of the population is becoming Hispanic. And then when you think about that 20 years ago, there were only maybe a dozen or so counties that had much of a Hispanic population at all. So it's really been a dramatic change and really in the last generation. So in agriculture, what we're seeing, in, generally speaking in the Midwest is uh, fewer farms. And if you look at, um, at the change in the number of farms between 2012 and 2017 that we've got 3, 3%, 5%, 9%, 8%, as much as 15% decrease in the number of farms uh, since 2012. Now that's a trend also that we saw in, um, in the last ag census as well. And, um, and we're also seeing a decreasing amount of land actually in farming. When we look at the Hispanics as principal operators of, of farms, um, we see a little bit different story. Um, the numbers are, are pretty small, uh, but if you look at the cha change in the number of farms, uh, we see some dramatic increases. In Missouri, we have 85%, in Wisconsin, 50%, and then two other states, Iowa and Michigan, uh, that the part of the research project we'll be talking about, are also seeing fairly large increases. And we also see the same in terms of the amount of land that, that, that Latino farmers are farming. Um, and then we look at the number of actual producers. Uh, there can be more than one uh, producer um, uh, in, in operating uh, in, a, in, a, in a particular area. And so we, we see 
um, the number of, of, of producers, farm producers, um, and farmland also increasing um, at, a, at a relatively high rate. And these are Latino producers. So they're going into farming at a rate much higher than what we're seeing um, in the, the general um, farming population, although their numbers are still pretty small. Uh, what we're trying to do then is get a better understanding about what that looks like. What is the what is the picture of the Latino farmer in the Midwest? What are the issues they're dealing with? And the model we've put together, uh, we put it. We we received a grant from NIFA um, to uh, study um, uh, farming and uh, Latino farmers in Missouri, Iowa, and Michigan in terms of looking at how they're integrating into their communities. Uh, Iowa uh, the farmers are bigger. We don't see as many. Um, we don't see as many. Uh, Latinos actually in farming because the land is more expensive and the farms are larger, but we have uh, farm workers that are interested in farming. And so we included them in our research. Michigan is a little more uh, established Latino farming community. Some of the farms are a little bit bigger. And in Missouri, we have a, a smaller, um, uh, we have mostly small farmers, folks that have just gone into farming mostly in the last 10, 10, 15 years. Um, and what we're, the model we're using is we're looking at, at different types of farming. Uh, those that are low farming capacity, but maybe highly diversified in their livelihood. Those with low farming capacity and not diversified in their terms of their livelihood. High farming capacity and not diversified, but high farming capacity and diversified. And this is what it looks like based on our sample. So um, with the uh, uh, low, uh, <clears throat> we see Lifestyle farmers with other economic activities, so maybe they're working in a business or they're working full time someplace else. Um, we see retirement lifestyle farmers, the Latinos that have, um, you know, recently retired and have bought land and uh, are typically leaving that as a legacy for their families. And then we have part time farmers with a commercial oriented operation that that might be um, uh, hoping to move to more of a full time farming. Um, and is a significant portion of their income strategy. And then we see the full-time commercial farmer. Um, the way we begin to operationalize that is to use the community capitals as a framework for exploring these, um, these, um, uh, the, these farming operations or the way they approach farming. So we're interested in their social capital, which is kind of the networks they have of farmer entrepreneurs and also others that they need to, to connect to in terms of being able to develop operations. Um, in terms, also we're interested in their human capital, which is really their experience and education. Um, the financial capital, the way, the capacity of which they can raise um, uh, 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 funds for investing in, in, in their operations, their natural capital, is the extent to which farmers have access to natural resource management practices, political capital is the degree to which the farmers have voice in their geographic communities, um, the bill capital, which is their physical assets, and the cultural capital, which in this case we're looking at how they're acculturating and becoming part of the communities in which they, they've moved into, and then the, their perceptions of the climate of those communities. So the project um, entailed uh, two, two period, primary, two primary uh, methodologies. The first was qualitative, where we explored um, the, uh, um, uh, the the experiences of the farmers from um, basically conducted focus groups with Latino farmers in um, each of the three states. And then we also did some focus groups with the uh, service providers to get a sense of what it's like for them to try to provide services to this community. And then we did a, a household survey. Uh, Maria Rodriguez is now going to talk a little bit about um, what we learned from the qualitative research. Maria? Yes. So she should I go on the phone? Can you hear me? Hi, Maria, yeah. we can hear you. There is a bit of an echo, so I think you should close out your computer audio. Okay, yeah. there you go. There you go, thanks. Okay, so some of so what we did is, as Steve mentioned, we conducted some focus groups with Latino farmers across uh, the three states, but here we're focusing more on the findings from Missouri. 
And uh, we also separately conducted some focus groups with service providers and then some um, more uh, individual interviews with um, farmers just to complement the focus groups because we can't get them all in a large group at once. Um, so we did find that they, these farmers are disconnected from our service providers in general. I think one of the main exceptions would be the NRCS program, some of those. And uh, some of the farmers don't even know these programs or services exist for farmers um, across the state. There's a lot of hesitation against loans. Uh, this is a cultural issue. Um, uh, for those who do have loans, uh, we see that there's a tremendous anxiety to pay them off as soon as possible. And this is particularly a problem for those who need to expand or say for some, for instance, that are in the poultry operations where it's tough to not be in a loan when say companies like Tyson are requiring you to uh, do upgrades every couple of years or so. Um, many have been in Missouri living for more than 20 years. Uh, the undocumented status is not an issue for this group. You wouldn't be able to buy land basically if you were. But there is a complex fear factor that exists kind of, um, it's kind of implicit there, but it's there. And it has to do with probably with the, what they've lived in the past and also with the extended family situation if they were to have some undocumented there that they fear uh, might be deported. Um, there's a lack of community integration. Um, this is stronger for farmers than for the general Hispanic population is what we found. And uh, this is not uh, atypical for farmers in general. Uh, farmers just like to be left alone sometimes. Uh, but um, for the Latinos, it has to also do with the fact that many work full-time jobs and so their free time is basically dedicated to the farm and they don't have much beyond much time beyond that uh, to do anything else in the community. Um, so as I said, the majority work full time. There are trust issues with the um, service providers. A lot of them, uh, this has to do with a general lack of trust with government. And, um, and again, this may not be just unique to Latino farmers, but that's also something we see commonly among farmers overall. But um, but, but in general, Latinos have, because of the uh, attacks that have been going on uh, against Latinos, there's, a, there's another layer there of trust issue if they identify you as being part of the government. Um, and, and they do sometimes identify many extension agents as being uh, part of the government in some, time, in some cases. Um, the heterogeneous Latino population, I think, is something important to mention because, yes, the majority come from Mexico, but we do see some, of course, like in the general Latino population in the U.S. This has to do mainly with geographical proximity with uh, these countries. So Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador dominate after Mexico. Uh, but we do see some uh, from South America, particularly Venezuela and Colombia is what we've identified. Um, what's important to understand here is that there are cultural differences in between these countries, but even within Mexico across regions. And so this is something that, uh, of course, in the statistics, we need to have Hispanic numbers, but when it comes to implementing programs, it becomes an issue because we do have to recognize that diversity in order for them to, um, to be able to, for us to be able to uh, uh, accommodate the different uh, cultural backgrounds. And, and become more comfortable with the diversity of farmers, not just Latinos in general, uh, overall. So what are some of the reasons these farmers are entering farm, uh, farming? Some are what we call kind of romantic. There's a passion for farming. Uh, they, this is a way they kind of see themselves connected to childhood experiences they had with their families back in Mexico or Guatemala or some or other country. Um, there's also um, something that's kind of unique for uh, Latinos, not, not actually unique, sorry, uh, this is the next point. Um, a way to provide a better quality of life for the family, so having the kids running around the farm is something that they, they like. They, and, and also they, uh, there's a certain admiration for some of the large-scale farmers that they, they see them as models. There are other more practical reasons, uh, but not necessarily always realistic when you look at uh, how they actually play out when compared to the intention. So for instance, uh, they see sometimes this as an investment for emergency. So if they have livestock, 
they may not, if they sell it in an emergency, they may actually be losing money. And this is something that, that does happen. Or if they're uh, saving for retirement, uh, they, they are assuming they're going to have all the energy to work as farmers as they do now uh, once they retire. Um, farming provides also some type of hope for the future of their fam families. They, they do have this idea of passing the land to future generations. Um, also, farming provides a sense of freedom from the kinds of jobs they take. Many have very uh, monotonous and very hierarchical jobs, and this is the, the opportunity for them to be their own boss and, and have some freedom out in the, in, in, in the outdoors. Um, may, some of them have worked in the agricultural sector, and after obtaining experience, they decided to, obtain, to invest uh, in the farm. Um, the next the next thing is um, we also see that there are some entrepreneurial opportunities identified for some, for instance, there are uh, families that own restaurants and so they want to produce their own, say, tomatillos and, and then um, do their own salsas for the, for the restaurant. All, others see opportunities um, in terms of why are we importing, even they mentioned me uh, products from Mexico, when we can actually produce them right here in Missouri. Um, and then they also see that there are some, um, say for instance, lamb uh, meat that uh, you can sell them at a higher price and they see there might be some profit opportunities for farmers there, although there's not a, a, a very good understanding of the value added portion of the supply chain when they mention that. Um, they also, uh, some of them have come, many of them actually have come from California into the Midwest, and so they see the Midwest as a, as a place where you can buy, um, it's easier to buy land and it's cheaper actually. Um, some uh, have, one thing that actually was very interesting was uh, that they see themselves actually as an opportunity to feed the U.S. in the future, and there's a sense of pride on that one, particularly perhaps kind of following up on the, all the attacks against Latinos, they want to kind of show that they can do something for this country and for their community. So we see some of that in the, in the findings. Um, something that's different uh, for the Latino population overall, and this is definitely coming out among the farmers, is when you look at the, the research on U.S. consumers, we see that those at higher income levels have higher preferences for organic and fresh local foods. But for Hispanics, this is also strong among low income. And, and, and buying a farm gives them that choice that they sometimes don't have if, if it's too expensive. Uh, growing their own for, uh, and, and their organic uh, vegetables is an option that, that helps them uh, get to that. Um, and as I said, also uh, farming provides a sense of pride. So again, they would like to be, uh, give back to their communities. Next slide, okay. So among the, um, the, produ the providers, what are the things that we found? So social capital definitely are limitations, not just from the, from the farmers, but also from the serv uh, service providers. Um, many want to connect, but they just don't know how. And um, others just don't recognize that these farm farmers actually exist. So many of these farmers, uh, if they exist, they're seen just as a hobby kind of farming. Um, Many agencies, of course, have experienced a lot of, uh, in the past years, cut in their staff numbers. And so uh, there is a, a recognition that to work with Latino farmers, uh, you have to invest in time. There's a, you have to invest in relationships, and they just don't have that time. Um, and then they do mention that some of the Latinos just don't approach them because of the fear factor that we have mentioned before. I think that one of the most important constraints we see is actually uh, how do we change the mindset that we currently have in the institutional, in all of these institutions that work with farming. So in, in, in the past decades, we have come to define um, uh, agriculture in say a handful of row crops and intensive livestock. So looking at far uh, new farmers, beginning farmers that are doing things differently, and actually they are attending uh, also uh, grow saying local foods or fresh foods and healthier products that are grown in the region, uh, they are still, the institutions are not um, ready to accommodate or to serve these uh, new kind of farmers. And the Latinos fall into these new kinds of farming that we're just starting to understand how are we going to be serving them better. Uh, again, the exception is the NRCS, particularly their uh, uh, high tunnel programs have been very successful with the Latinos. Um, 
There we see a, a picture with, at one of the Latino farms there in Monet. We did another one recently also in Mount Vernon. Um, and, um, and then uh, also the fact that Latino farmers are part-time, most of them, and so uh, there are very rigid institutional in, um, constraints in terms of the office hours, particularly USDA agencies are very rigid about this. We've seen some agents uh, who have mentioned that they would like to work after hours to go serve the Latinos, but then their, their supervisors uh, are not comfortable with kind of compensating, giving them uh, the, some time off during, uh, during regular office hours for that. And then financial capital, um, it's also an issue that uh, the service providers see. There's, um, there's a problem with record keeping. Latinos really need help with that. Um, and then there are, again, some uh, complaints about Latinos and not wanting to commit, but uh, I think there's also a lack of understanding behind uh, what all, the, all these farmers have been uh, through to get to the point where they can buy a farm. It, has just, it just hasn't been easy. And so it's, it, it sometimes is an issue for them to commit for long-term or loan, say. So there is, again, the fear of debt that is recognized among service providers. And with that, I think Corinne would present the next slide. So uh, this is Corinne uh, Valdivia, and I'll talk a little bit about the findings from the survey that we are we did last year and this year, and we continue to work on uh, still um, ident identifying uh, the farmers around the state, both uh, here as well as in Michigan and Iowa. And as Steve mentioned, uh, we're working with a strength-based model or assets-based model uh, where we're looking at wealth creation. So I'll talk a little bit about the characteristics of uh, the farmers that are participant that are engaged. So we have here uh, basically um, a slide that shows us that farmers have been engaged in farming for um, more than 10 years, and that's around 35% of the, the population that was interviewed, uh, while uh, other farmers uh, have been engaged between six and 10 years. So more than 50% of the population has been engaged in farming in Missouri for a while now, uh, which is really encouraging. Uh, the majority of those that were interviewed as uh, farmers were um, a male, uh, so we have 87% in our sample that are male and only 13% uh, that are female. Um, with 50% um, of the farmers being between the ages of 35 and 40, 54, meaning that they're really in, in their productive years. They're a young population compared to uh, mainstream farmers that tend to be older uh, currently in agriculture, especially in our state in Missouri. Um, most 54% or the majority of farmers have more than high school education, but we do have uh, farmers that are um, have ninth grade of, or below education, which is an issue in terms of figuring out how to build bridges and develop materials that can um, be useful for different types of uh, levels of education in terms of human capital. We find also that in terms of participating in, in bridging networks, in, in, in this particular case, we're talking about uh, the social capital of being part of a, a farming cooperative, for example. This is very small for uh, being part of uh, a farming cooperative, but this is not unusual because not only Latino farmers are in this, in this situation, but most farmers are in this situation, especially in the areas where we're working. Um, then um, in terms of social capital, the news are very positive in the sense that Latinos that are farmers trust Latinos and non-Latinos in the same way. So there's not, there's not a difference in their attitude regarding who they trust. And um, so we have that, percent or 33 percent depending on uh, being um, a Latino or non-Latino, uh, 33 percent trust them both more or less equally. And the same uh, with uh, the level of trust being some trust, it's again, it's 40, 48 percent. So they're pretty trusting population, 
both for Latinos and non-Latinos in this particular group that has been settled for many years in, in, in this area and have been engaged in farming for a long time. Um, in terms of built assets, 81% uh, of the respondents own a home. They have good collateral. They are very well connected to the internet and they actually uh, have savings and checkings accounts. So they, they do uh, participate in the financial institutions. They don't like to borrow, but they do uh, use their banks. And um, their level of income, um, at least 50% of the population that are farmers that were interviewed had an uh, income greater than $60,000. Um, they grow a diversity of products, um, but you can see that uh, in, in this slide, the majority are doing uh, chicken and, and beef. Uh, and so one of the things that's important in, in this particular context is actually working with farmers to figure out marketing strategies and ways of working together so that they are in a better position to negotiate for prices in the markets. And that's a situation that's not unique to smallholder farmers that are Latinos, but also other smallholder farmers in the region. They also uh, have um, um, a very uh, wide range of earnings. 25% uh, of the respondents really have earnings, annual earnings of 20,000 or more while you have a high proportion of the population that has an income uh, generated from uh, sales that's between um, 6000 and $20,000 uh, as well. In terms of their um, natu natural capital, 38% um, are very likely uh, to find land through friends and through um, networks of family. Uh, and they, the farm size is very diverse. So it goes from uh, having very small plots of land to 36% of the farmers having between 20 and 50 acres of land. And a small proportion, close to 15%, have greater than 50 um, acres of land. They are not strong in terms of being engaged in political organizations or what we call linking social capital and bridging social capital, which is an area that um, probably it's explained because of the fact that they're so engaged not only in farming but in other economic activities, that the time that they have left to engage in other events uh, is very um, difficult or challenging for them. And uh, in terms of their acculturation, unlike Latino farmers that are settling for work, uh, we see that um, this population group is highly acculturated both in English and Spanish. F almost 50% of this group works well in both cultures and uses both languages well to communicate. And, um, and the other thing that's a good news in this particular group is that the community climate, uh, meaning the negative environment that they're facing, uh, seems to not be a big issue for them. Because in general, with the scales of negative experiences with discrimination or being pressured to speak in English or feeling that they're in a negative environment, they mostly disagreed or um, uh, strongly disagree with those uh, types of statements, which is unlike uh, the situation of workers in rural communities in the Midwest. So some of the takeaway messages in this particular group is that although there are only 1,400 Latino farmers currently in Missouri, they are increasing very fast. We have 59% increase in the past five years. While the farms are very small, they do tend to mirror uh, overall smallholder farmers in, in the Midwest, which tend to be the largest proportion of farming uh, in, in this area. They are uh, not connected to stakeholders and the mainstream practice of farming meet being uh, uh, the different types of service providers that traditionally support commodity farming. Um, but they are really uh, very well acculturated so that 
possibility of creating connections with them is uh, much easier uh, than uh, with um, other with the traditional uh, Latino population. And so there is a lot of potential for building bridges uh, to the mainstream uh, farming practice. I'll pass it on now to Steve. Uh, thank you, Corinne. So in terms of future research and um, actions, um, there's there's quite a lot that, that we need to know, that we need to better understand. Um, we need more effective strategies that um, support or contribute to the acculturate, acculturation in the practice of farming. Farmers um, need to, they, they, they need a better understanding, better pathways to, to becoming um, uh, uh, more successful within the context of mainstream farming here in the United States. Uh, we need to better understand the potential contributions of Latinos farmers in terms of wealth creation in agriculture and in rural communities generally. Uh, they do, uh, they're high savers, they do invest the, the, the money they have in, in, in businesses and property and those kinds of things. Um, and uh, but we we need to better understand what the what their potential uh, contributions could be. We also need to think about how we break down um, the isolation of the Hispanic farmers. You know, they're um, they 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 too tend to keep to themselves. And and while they're they're doing okay in terms of building small business, in terms of being able to to grow and um, uh, become more relevant in the larger. Uh, farming uh, uh, community, they're going to need to to think about how they can. Um, 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 uh, they need pathways in which they can make that happen. Um, so we need some innovative approaches, both to the research, to the extension, but also to um, how we go about uh, building wealth for Hispanic farmers and other operators outside, uh, operating outside the mainstream. There's just a lot of opportunities for. Um, for for farming to, to to grow in different ways, and we need more innovative approaches to, to research and extension in terms of how we approach or understand those those op opportunities. Uh, we need to explore the range of institutional arrangements and niche opportunities that can facilitate the the growth of Hispanic farmers and Hispanic in, uh, enterprises. Where are those places in the marketplace that they can make the the most impact? And then. Uh, pathways for Hispanic farmers becoming more acculturated to the practice of farmers? How do we better support integration um, in agriculture? How do we make it possible for the farmers to better connect to the resource agencies, lenders, and those kinds of things, creating uh, relationships of trust that, that allow these farmers to become um, more integrated in, in, in terms of how they go about doing their business? And then what are the resources that can enable and, and potentially grow Hispanic farmers in, in, in U.S. agriculture? Um, and that, that's the end of our formal program. Thanks so much for everyone uh, who attended. And if you have any suggestions related to future events for CFAIR, please feel free to contact information at cfair.org. That's information at cfair.org. We're happy to consider your suggestions for um, webinars in the, in the future. Thank you all for your great presentations and we'll be in touch.